What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're going to be checking out Clan Folk. Uh, they've sent me a larger version of the game that we can check out. Uh, we actually took a look at a limited demo that they sent over sometime back in like September, I think. And so anyways, the game has had some graphical sprucing up, it's had some bits and pieces moved around, and it's time for us to take another look, because it's been about six months or more. Uh, if you've never seen Clan Folk before, what is it? This game is RimWorld, but effectively it's set in the medieval Scottish Highlands. Uh, and this is not really a game about, like, military or, like, fighting bandits or anything else like that. Uh, this is more of a game that is about man versus nature, basically. Uh, this is a game where your principal antagonist is more than likely going to be things like blizzards and storms and famine and things of that nature, rather than bandits running up inside all of your huts and murdering your characters. To someone like me, that's really, really appealing. Uh, because I, I prefer those sorts of things. That's one of the reasons why I like The Long Dark so much, is that the game really doesn't have things that are trying to murder you, except for, like, the occasional wolf. But even if The Long Dark did not have any wolves at all, I would still think it was a fantastic game, and I would play it all the time. Like, I don't really take that into account. And so every now and again, it's nice to have one of those games that takes a gameplay loop that is somewhat familiar, but it removes all the zombies and the aliens and the robots and everything else, and just kind of tries to go its own way and since this one's more focused on like survival and crafting and like making things and stockpiling and stuff like that uh, to me that's very very appealing and so anyways we're gonna dive on and play clan folk for about 25 30 minutes see if it's something you wanted to add to your wish list or otherwise pass on before the game goes up for sale if after watching this you did indeed want to get the game for yourself i'll have a link for you down below in the description and then on top of that i don't know why I feel like lately in my intros, I have really been struggling with the word description. I feel like I've made so many edits in like the last two weeks. I don't know what it is. It's like my brain has spontaneously decided to forget how to pronounce the word description. And I can't describe it. Anyways, the link is down below. Uh, you'll find my Discord and my Twitch stream down there. Let's get going. Uh, we will go for a new game. Apparently, we can shift things around as well. I'm going to kind of leave it like center stage. Let's go ahead and build a world real fast from that seed. Okay, yeah, this place looks pretty nice. I have found that a lot of the maps look somewhat standard. So before I recorded this, I the game is procedural. Actually, maybe, let's go back real fast. Maybe it always just starts on the same seed. I didn't actually think to test. I was just kind of like... Let's try this out. There we go. It's possible that it doesn't randomize the seed when you click the new game key every single time, and that's why they've all said that's what it was, see? That's what it was. I was kind of like absent-mindedly listening to Spotify and just going through like pre my preliminaries with this game, and I was like, oh, all these maps are kind of similar, and then I drooled all over myself without actually checking my facts, so there it is. Uh, it just doesn't recycle. When you hit the new game key, it doesn't automatically reshuffle the seed. Uh, some games do, some games don't. I do actually like this location. I think if we could get ourselves in, like in this little nook over here, or in this little nook right here, I think that'd make for kind of a delightful home. Inside this menu, you do have the opportunity to customize your tartan if you want. And in fact, I think they put a Splattercat tartan in, but I can't remember the code to bring it up. But anyways, uh, my family is Clan Douglas. We came over from Scotland in the 1890s uh, to the United States. And so anyways, there we are right there. There's our tartan. Uh, it says never behind. I think Douglas has a couple different ones, though. Uh, there's forward, and there's like one or two others that have been used over the years. But anyways, there it is. We've got the tartan, and then you can go for whatever start you want, or you can customize. Uh, so basically, this is the same as in RimWorld. They've got kind of like the Lonesome Traveler. They've got the Standard Start, the Tribals. Uh, basically, you can do that, or in this game, you can actually customize your start, and you can dictate and decide what you want to start with when it comes to your colonists. So that's actually pretty cool. You've got, like, buy-in points and whatnot in order to decide that, but it's still a nice feature to include inside the game. We'll just go for the standard fresh start. That's given us access to two seniors, Matthew and Agnes, and then Elspit and John. Okay, that's fine. I mean, our Matthew is missing a T. He's a 1T. My name is Matthew. But I've got two T's. As is right and proper. And so anyways, we must always be wary of the one T's. They're always up to no good. Uh, we'll go ahead and start our clan off. And it looks like it has dumped us right next to this little area down here. So let's take a look around. And we'll try to figure out exactly what area looks the best to us. 
So I'm thinking I really, really like that spot right there. There's not like a whole lot of food around. But I do like this spot right here because it's going to be relatively easy to clear out all of these trees. And this gives us a lot of separated fishing spots that we can play around with on top of that water gathering spots and bathing spots. So yeah, I think we're going to go up here. Like this is going to be our spot. Uh, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to design some objects. Uh, so all of our characters have different needs. So if you take a look at one of our characters, Hannah here, for example, and yes, their tartan does change in-game in accordance with which family tartan you gave them. Uh, but anyways, they've got their mood, uh, they've got their work efficiency, they've got juvenile. I'm not exactly sure. I think that's just them growing up. That's actually their age, because if we go over to an adult, yeah, it shifts over. Uh, we've got their overall health, we've got their food meter, their water meter, their sleep meter, how warm they are. We've also got how clean they are, their bathroom status how much social interactivity they've been getting, uh, their environment right here, and how much they're enjoying it. And of course, one of the most important stats that all of us have to take care of in our day-to-day -day life, uh, the amount of plaid that we're currently wearing right now. At the moment, it just stays at 2,000 out of 2,000. I don't know if that's just a joke or if it's going to be like a planned implemented mechanic at some point, but I recommend that it definitely be a planned implemented mechanic. Uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to tell them all to gather some berries here. That's going to be our first task, is just graze and grab whatever gatherables are laying around on the ground. Because we're going to need food for a couple days. Because this game, uh, it doesn't really have a research system from what I've seen so far. This is a game about ideas, and effectively you've got people in your colony that will innovate as you do certain tasks. They'll think of a better way to do that task, and it will unlock new buildings and things. I don't know what kind of replayability or like long-term viability that's going to offer, but I do think it is a novel idea. We'll go ahead and we'll put a drinking spot right there. And we'll put a drinking spot right there just to separate them a little bit. We'll put a wash zone. Kind of like we don't want people to wash in the same spot that they're drinking from. So maybe we'll get like a wash spot up there and like a wash spot right there. I mean, this is not a flowing tributary anyways. So I, I feel like getting in it is a really, really bad idea no matter what. But nobody listens to me. They treat me like the village, I village idiot. The downside for them, though, is that I've gone international ever since this internet thing started off. And so that's a problem they're going to have to deal with. Uh, we need seven beds. So we've just got sleeping spots for right now. We'll go ahead and slam those on in real fast. There's our seven spots. And then we need to gather some branches and we need to gather some stones. So I'm going to go ahead and queue those up as well. We'll tell them to gather pretty much all the stones from that area right there. And then we'll also have them pull some branches from some trees over here just to get us some baseline starting materials. And I'm going to let her rip and we'll come back once they've got all of these tasks done. One thing I do really like about this game is that actually everything is pretty clearly delineated. Uh, with the color palette, they've actually picked a pretty good opposite color for anything that's been flagged for gathering. And so it's very, very visible, and it's easy to, like, optically digest, I guess. It's easy to see. I said that in one of the more complicated ways that I could have said that. And now I feel pretentious. Now I feel pretentious and I feel bad about myself. So I take it back. Uh, they've used highly visible icons, which I think is a really, really good idea. That's an underrated part of games. I can't stand it when the color palette for, like, random little icons and whatnot is selected poorly and, like, blends into the background and you can't hardly see it. You find yourself, like, squinting at the screen all the time. So that's really, really good. So most of our twigs and berries and our gathering spots have concluded their cycle for right now. What that means is we need to get some things up and running in order to make the place more comfortable. So I would recommend we get a sizable food stockpile for right now so that they'll drop it off over there. We also have an ingredients stockpile. I'll probably make that about that size right there. I don't know if they're going to tear up that stone uh, while they're out and about working, but if they do, I think it'll be helpful anyways, uh, just largely because we need more stones. You're always going to need more stones. You're always going to need more branches, stuff like that. As far as I see it in my head noodle right now, I think we're going to chop down pretty much all these trees right here, and that should give us a fairly safe place to operate. Uh, the reason you want to clear all this out is because the last time I played this game, fire was a huge problem. Uh, once you made, like, a communal cook fire and, like, warming area, basically, uh, there was a pretty solid chance that embers were going to jump from the fire onto the grass and start fires. 
I think they may have nerfed that because I was playing this build uh, prior to recording this video and we didn't light off any fires and I distinctly remember the last time I played this game uh, you basically had to pave the entire area with cobbles before you put down a campfire otherwise you were like virtually guaranteed to have some massive wildfire that was going to be a big problem. Oh no dude it's Margit. Oof, Margit broke my heart in Elden Ring the first time I fought him. He made me feel bad about myself. I don't know if I can have a little dude rattling around the camp that just, like, consistently reminds me of my failings. Alright, so, over here, from watching the game and observing for a little bit, I have found that the AI seems to be pretty good with its priorities. I haven't gotten too late into the game where you have a lot more colonists, but in, like, the early phases of the game, I haven't really been frustrated. Like, sometimes in games like this, there's sort of those moments where you're like, oh my god, why won't you do the task? And you're like digging through their priorities and whatever to get them to prioritize the things you want them to prioritize. In this game, it hasn't really been a problem. Uh, we need to do a grass clearing so that we have reeds and stuff. Uh, so that people will know how to craft using reeds and like boughs and things like that. So we'll clear out all that grass over there and then we will also tell them to get after the reeds on this side. Now, we are going to have to replant these, but I think our colony is going to have a little bit easier of a time just due to the fact that we have so many ponds around us right now. The last map that I played on, there was only one pond, and once you stripped it of all the cattails, you kind of had to, like, reseed it and just sort of, like, wait and hope for the best. This location, I think, is going to be a lot better in that regard. Huh. I thought that this was just going to be like plains grass, but apparently these are oats. Very nice. So if we can thresh those, actually, that should be a decent, long-lasting food source. Like, oats last for a while. And I actually, I really, really like oats. I have oatmeal for breakfast pretty much every single day. I've got like seven different flavors in my cabinet right now, and I'm just kind of selective in the morning, you know what I mean? Like a fancy British gentleman from the 1800s selecting what vintage of brandy he would like to drink in his study. I'm mm. Indeed, I think that the raisins and spice will do just fine. Indeed. Alright, so I think we have more objects that we need to get done. As far as basic... Actually, we haven't really unlocked anything. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of things unlocked for right now. Uh, so I think we just gotta wait it out. In the meantime, they're working on more important research. Stuff like Buckfast and Munchie Boxes and things of that nature. There it goes. So it's specifically the reeds that you get from over here by the water that trigger the next step. Sounds good. So we need to put in a thresher. If you've never seen a thresher before, basically in, in a farm when you're growing wheat. I had to do this when I was a kid. Anyways, I didn't grow up on a farm. It's just like my parents were constantly sending me off to like reenactments and stuff from like the pioneer days. And so anyways, you've got a big flail and you put the sheaves of grain out. And you put out these tray things and you beat them. You beat them with the flail and it separates the wheat from the chaff. Uh, the chaff is generally kind of inedible and unpleasant. And so you've got to get it separated. Otherwise, the bread that you make with like the grain or whatever, it'll be like lumpy and it'll be kind of like gross. Uh, we've got eel traps now. So we can go and catch eels. I actually really, really like unagi. I don't know if you guys, I mean, I had unagi on accident. So like when I first started dating my wife, I wanted to impress her. So she was like, you know, I, I, I was like, let's go out to a fancy dinner. You know what I mean? Let's wear nice clothes. Let's just like forget about everything going on. Let's go out to a nice dinner at a nice restaurant. And I picked out like this Japanese steakhouse and we go in there and like we start ordering for dinner, right? And I had never had eel before, but they said that they had kind of like a breaded fresh unagi or whatever. And like I'm kind of a risk taker when it comes to food. Like I'm kind of a foodie. I like to try new things. And so anyways, I was like, I'll have the unagi. Now, me being young and me being stupid, I didn't realize that there was no price on the menu uh, because this was like a fancy place and I didn't go to fancy. Like fancy to me was the sizzler. You know what I mean? And so like I didn't notice this detail. Uh, if you ever go to a restaurant and the price is not on the dish and you order that dish without thinking about it or without looking at it, um, I promise you, when, when you open the bill at the end of that meal, your eyelids are going to fly off your face and stick to the ceiling. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, lesson learned. Lesson learned. Uh, let's see here. So we can process some oat grains. Yeah, we could probably do that. Let's process some oat grains. 
I don't know. Oh, apparently they're flammable. Oh, we'll also get some straw out too. Nice. So how many of these does it take in order to get those? So 25 oat sheafs. How many oat sheafs do I have? Many, many oat sheafs, like 360. So technically we could like beat the seeds out of a whole bunch of these. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if that'll teach us how to make porridge or whatever, but it wouldn't be the worst idea. Uh, we also need more branches for something. I don't know what it wants me to do, but let's gather up some branches here. Let's make the game happy. It seems like it's a little bit cranky with me right now. I do like the shadow effects, actually. They're kind of understated. I just noticed them at the moment, how, like, during the evening, there actually is directional lighting happening in this game that throws shadows in the opposite direction, or uh, in the direction that the sun is shining. So that's really, really nice. Looks good. It's actually got a very pleasant appearance. Hey, looky there. It actually looks like these last forever. It looks like they don't decay. Good stuff. I'll take it. Yeah, let's get our oat grains rocking. Uh, do we have anything else that I can do? So we have planting here. So we can officially plant reeds now that we've stripped them all off from the edges of the camp. We need the branches so that we can make the eel traps because I assume those are made using wattle and daub. We have hunting, farming, storage. A branch pile wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, let's branch out a little bit. We'll get some branch piles over here so that they're not taking up space inside of our collective area. And then we'll collect a few more branches, and then we'll just let her run. Ah, we've invented fire. Very, very good. We have the ability to deploy the flame. We can get our Tom Hanks on and just stand bare-chested screaming at the ocean, I have made fire fire okay and then now that the eel traps are rocking too uh, we've got eels what I would like to do is set up auto supply on these eels let's make it so that we're keeping like 40 eels in supply I don't know how many eels your average person is gonna eat on kind of like a day-to-day -day basis not too sure on that front but you know what whatever I'm a little bit hesitant to deploy a campfire right now, no matter how badly the game wants me to do it, largely because I haven't gotten to clear out all the trees yet, but we can't cook our eels without fire? So maybe I'll put the fire over here by, like, the water? And we'll just pray that it doesn't make the hop and kind of light these oak trees on fire or whatever? Is that what that is? What kind of oak tree? What kind of tree is it? It actually doesn't say, I don't think. It just says tree. It's a nondescript tree. It's a tree that doesn't like labels, okay? Why do human beings always have to put labels on everything? Uh, we have learned how to make a stone hoe, my old nickname from college. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll throw together two of those. Uh, those are going to be used for farming, I think? And then, of course, the game is upset with me right now because I don't have enough food. There are some berries remaining over on this side. I'll kind of just click and drag. I do this in RimWorld, too. I basically just go across the entire map and tell them to gather everything, and then I just make it like kind of like mid-priority. So they do all their major stuff, but then like after that, they go ahead, oh, it's for gathering clay. And clay is going to be around the banks of rivers. Typically, what happens is clay forms underneath tributaries. And so, for example, where I live right now, I actually had a tremendous amount of problems when I moved into this house because when we were, like, fixing up the landscaping, because my house was basically, like, on a dirt lot, there was, like, nothing, you know what I mean? Unfortunately, there's, like, a foot of soil, and underneath that foot of soil, there's a stuff called caliche clay, and it's because the place where I live is an ancient dried-up riverbed. And so, anyways, if you're ever looking for clay... Figure out where the river, the creek beds, and the lakes were at. That tends to be the easiest place to find clay. Uh, apparently, these guys have stinky butts. They're just running around with butt stink right now. Are they about to, like, deuce themselves? Like, I know there's, like, a poop hole that you can... I'm, I'm not even joking right now. Like, you can build a poop hole, but... I don't know if we've invented it yet. Like, I don't know if the... Oh, there it is. I was going to say, I wasn't quite sure if they have to crap their pants first before they'd be like, you know, it would be slightly more efficient if we did this in an isolated location that's away from the food and water supply. Like, I didn't know if it was going to be that kind of adaptive game. You feel me? Hopefully they don't take a dump in the water. All right, so there's one of our dookie holes. It's already sizzling effervescently. 
Ah, uh, yes. Oh, and we have other stuff we can build now, too. We've got a stone axe down here. Let me get two stone axes built up. Do I have the things for the stone axe? I've got to be getting low on stone because it takes a lot more stone to build things than you would assume in this game. And so we've got lots of it laying around. I just didn't know if I needed to stockpile it anytime soon. But yeah, we need to start chopping down trees and we need to start clearing bushes. Otherwise, we're going to have a bad time. It looks like our first eel harvest is going to be coming in quite soon. I will build some pickaxes, but I, I sort of have a caveat here. We're not really mountainous living right now. Like, I'm not trying to be, like, cave scots. And so, I just, I don't think we're going to need it. Maybe someday we might, I guess. Just in case, you know, the stones get a little bolder. But, there you go. We got more rocks for the road now. There is twine. And it still wants me to do these stone picks, just in case there's an unlock attached to stone picks. I'll go ahead and make two of them, just in case. You never know. And then eels. There they are. We got eels over here. Uh, go ahead and maintain, like, so what does cooking them do? So 2,000 food, and as they stand right now, they're 2,000 food. And it looks like they do decay. So we're going to want to make a granary, I think. Something that's, like, indoors. And I think we have unlocked some walls. So we've got, like, a dry stone fence. Which I think is just going to be, like, a stacked stone fence would be my guess. But we have learned how to make things out of straw. And we can make things out of gravel. So we may have some options here. We may be all right. Dude, who left one of the sickles? The st who left our best stone hoe right next to the poop hole? It's very unsanitary. Can you guys just for a second pretend like you've got some standards? I need you guys to just, just for a minute. We could do a hay wall. It seems like it's kind of expensive, though, and highly flammable. So anyways, maybe I should cook these as soon as they come out. We'll say, uh... Just bump it on up to 40, I guess, so that it matches the production. And then we'll kind of watch what happens with the food supply to figure out. Basically, we'll keep an eye on the food supply to try to figure out whether this number is going up or down as time goes along. And one thing that's kind of cool is the graphic sort of changes over here. You can see them skewering the eels and putting them onto the fire, which is nice. Let's check out this fire effect. Oh, it's not too bad. That looks pretty good. And it actually interferes right there and dithers into the shadows being thrown by the sun. That's a nice little detail. Apparently, I have the ability to mine gravel now. Mining gravel is not a bad idea. I think I'll probably just pick up more rocks, though, until we have this area cleaned out. Like, I don't know, dude. Like, I feel like we're going to be wearing a lot of sandals and, like, open-toed shoes. And it just feels to me like stony areas are non-conducive to being happy and having unbloodied toes when you're in that kind of environment. And so, like, in the interim, until we learn how to invent closed-toe shoes, I think it's a really good idea for us to just pick up all the rocks and put them in one central location. Uh, we can also gather clay. So I will tell them to gather some clay. Just from some of these piles down here. And we'll just sort of see what happens, I guess. Yeah, just gather some clay. And I want to see what that does if there's any type of, like, land deformation or anything that's going to be factored on into, you know, the overall gameplay. The funny thing is, when a baby has to poop, they just take the baby over to the poop hole and they just, like, shake the baby over the top of the poop hole. In my, in my mental canon now, I just assume that that's how people potty train their children, is you just, like, hold them over the toilet and just shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, until they get it. So how is, like, the, the eel cooking going? Oh, he cooks five at a time. That's actually really good. Okay. It does seem like it decays pretty quickly, so I don't know if these are going to hold through winter. Like, we're going to have to figure out a way. Oh, a charcoal kiln. Nice. Okay. And then we've also got twine. I would guess that twine would probably either advance us towards getting bows or do something else. So it takes 10 straw. How much of the straw do I have? 162. Okay. Let's call it. Let's maintain. Let's maintain 10 twine. 
at all times. I don't know how much twine is going to go into your average object. I actually watched a pretty entertaining, like, educational GIF on Reddit the other day where it was people, like, somewhere in Eastern Europe, I think, and they were making rope, like, the old-fashioned way, like how it was done in medieval times, and it was such a fascinating process. Like, it seemed also very labor-intensive and very tiring and very exhausting, but it was also, like, fascinating. Like, it was really, really cool to see how people did that. And so anyways, but yes, I've, I know how to thresh grain, and I know how to churn butter as well, just in case you were wondering. I was raised in kind of like a... The best way I know how to describe it is like Mennonites, I guess. Like, like a separatist kind of very, very, very... Very isolated, very closed sort of Mennonite group, I guess, is the best way that I know how to describe it. Like, that's not, that's kind of reductive. It would take a lot more exploration. But I, I really don't want to spend the whole episode talking about it. And so, anyways, um, when I was growing up, practical skills like threshing grain and churning butter and making mattresses out of hay uh, were considered must-learn skills. In fact, I can remember there was a kid that was in another family that our family was associated with that they actually made their own mattresses and I hated sleeping over at his house cuz you'd get poked by you get poked by like straw and springs and all kinds of stuff, man. It was it was the worst. It was deeply unpleasant. Pretty much everybody I knew growing up was named like Abraham or like Isaac or like Elijah, like all those old biblical names, you know what I mean? <laughs> Like, all those names that, like, when they show those pictures of, like, the dead-eyed people in the 1800s that are, like, blankly looking at the camera while they slowly starve on film. <laughs> like, this is Abraham Shaw, circa 1864, in the wild lands of Nebraska. A famine had struck. Like, basically kind of, like, similar. Oh, you guys ate all the food, huh? I mean, at least everybody got fed before it all went wrong. So that's good, but I do think we're going to need a few more eel traps. Uh, it looks like they're eating through it pretty quick. They ate 8 out of 10 of the eels that we produced so far. And all things considered, we did set that up like halfway through the day. But my recommendation is we trap pretty much all of these right here. And one thing I like about this game is the accuracy. Like if you look at the eel traps, uh, this is basically the exact same technique you would use for a fish trap or for a turtle trap. Although a turtle trap uses punji sticks. But anyways... It's right here. Basically, there's a wide mouth, and then there is a depression on the opposite side of where it becomes, like, uh, concave or whatever. So it, it, it diverts inwards like a funnel. And then there's basically a convex basket on the other side that goes low enough that this part right here is above the waterline. But this part right here is below it, and so the fish get into it, and they get trapped, and they can't get back out. And this is a pretty common tactic that was used by just about every tribal society all across the world for fishing. Uh, pretty much everybody figured it out unanimously or learned it from a neighboring tribe in humanity's prehistory. Actually, it looks like each person needs five eels per day, because I was looking at their food right here, and they have 10,000 capacity, and one eel gives 2,000. So really, we need as many of these eel traps as we have people. And if we don't have that, we're always going to be struggling, basically. Uh, so I think we're going to have to put in a lot more of these if we want to survive. So let's go ahead, and I'm going to drop a third eel trap on each side. That gives us six eel traps, and that'll give us seven. And we're going to bring in... I Actually, I need to adjust the numbers on these as well. But I'm going to adjust the numbers once they're all built. How much does it take us to build an eel trap? Like, what is that costing me right now? Let's see. Hunting and then eel trap. It's taking five branches and 20 straw. That's okay. I have that. Well, I don't have the branches, actually. We need to go and gather more branches. So one thing I would like is for that to be automated for, like, the simple caveman tasks, like gather stone or gather branches. Uh, just to save you a couple of clicks, it'd be a good idea that if they don't have the material they need in order to build like a very, very rudimentary thing, and that material is easily available and picked up off the ground, uh, it should just auto-add that to go get branches or go get stones. It's one of those things that would speed up the process a little bit, in my opinion. We really need these eel traps to get done, otherwise everybody's going to have a bad time tonight. Like, luckily, I think most people filled up on food. 
before everything fell apart. But if we don't get some food going, we're going to have a bad time. Are there any more berries rocking around? I don't think that, like, there's a couple down here, but it's starting to be a pretty good hike to go get berries. Actually, there's a bunch of them out in that field right there. Okay, yeah, go go forage. Go hunt and gather. Uh, the other thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to... Oh, we got a waddle fence, too. Nice. Waddle, waddle, waddle. Uh, we've also got a sleeping mat right here. So it takes two twine and 25 straw. So we're going to need to thresh some more grain, too, to get straw out. So let's go ahead, and we will go to the thresher. And it looks like I have about 200 of those left to process. And so we'll put those in real fast. I don't think that they can eat the oat grains. I think. But it looks like the oats stay viable forever. So not too terrible, but we are going to need to be able to, like, with oats, you shouldn't need to do much but mix them with water and mix them with milk, basically, to soften them up a bit and then heat and stir until it turns into porridge. Oh, no, dude, the rain is going to ruin our oats. It specifically said not to get them wet. Oh, yeah, dude, they're decaying pretty fast. I forgot that Scotland was a, a wet place, a place with much wetness to be concerned of. But all of the eel traps are in, so that's great. I don't think we had enough eel traps, so we may have to survive exclusively off of just, like, wads of berries from for the next couple days. But it does look like our line of people hunting down berries are doing pretty well. Honestly, I'm impressed. Like, this game has kind of, like, the same visual flair as RimWorld, but they've added in a whole bunch of little details that I think just make the game pop a lot more and make the game look pretty good. You probably won't be able to see the detail because YouTube has the bitrate of, like, a 2003 Flash player. Uh, but this will probably be all pixelated right here and all de uh just due to the way that YouTube works. Like, somehow in the year of our Lord 2022, their bitrate is still, like, 12 million, which is, like, half of what you need for actual 1080p, like, lossless. And so, anyways... But if you play the game proper itself, it is quite a good-looking game that's got that same art style as RimWorld, but at the same time has a few little graphical additions with, like, the shadows and, like, the leaves and, like, you know, the trees and the grass and things like that that make it work and make it look pretty good, in fact, in my opinion. And we do need to chop down some trees, actually. Now that we've done all of the stuff that we've done, let's go ahead and knock down all these trees over here to avoid any kind of, like, fire issue. We do have ten eels ready to go. I don't know if we can light a fire when it's raining, though. So that may be a point of contention that causes problems for my peepo. Lighting a fire when it's raining is kind of difficult. With modern stuff, it's not quite so bad. You just kind of, like, throw some kerosene on that thing and get it going. Like, cover it briefly, throw some kerosene on it. But I would assume that lighting a fire in the rain in, like, the 1100s would actually be a lot more difficult. That would probably be a pain in the old Ghiblis. Uh We do have a straw pile now, which is pretty cool. I don't know why, but in games like this, I'm always kind of a sloppy sucker for, like, storage mediums. I don't know why. They just make me happy. Oh, wow, we actually have, like, a little bit of everything. We've got, like, a haystack over here? Okay, all right. Now we've got a place to lose our needles. Sweet, dude. We've got a log pile over here. Throw that together. Yeah, we'll just have, like, one of everything. We've got a heap for rocks. Sure, why not? Well, that might not be the best spot for it. That may have been... That may have been premature. Uh, we may want to put that elsewhere. But we've got a stone pile right here. We've got, like, all kinds of cool stuff. I love that they give you different storage mediums for every single thing. That really satisfies kind of my obsessive compulsive nature when it comes to, like, storing and sorting things. I don't know if you guys did this, but when I was a kid, I used to feel like, you know how you would have, like, loose coins and stuff? You keep them in a piggy bank or whatever? I used to dump out my piggy bank all the time, and I would sort all of my coins by type. And then I'd mix them up, and then I'd resort them again, just over and over and over again. I don't know what that means, but, like, I did it all the time when I was a kid, like, constantly. I was, like, one of my favorite activities. It wants me to make a butcher block, but I'm not so convinced. I think the game is lying to me. Like, I don't think that I need a butcher block right now because we haven't invented the technology that is necessary in order to, like, catch rabbits or anything. Like, we have twine, but we haven't figured out the process behind, like, we haven't figured out the strategy 
and we haven't figured out the method behind designing things like snares, for example. I don't know how many rabbits there would actually be in Scotland. I assume there's rabbits in Scotland, right? Like rabbits, foxes, all that kind of stuff. Then again, we also have to take this back in time by like a thousand years, because I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff in the UK that went extinct, and in the 1100s it probably still existed. But then again, I guess that would be a subject that I'm not entirely educated on. Oh good, he's cooking up the eels, man. Good for you. Eel it up, brother. And we're about to get like a big eel yield over here. Noise. Uh, so instead of having crappy beds that are actually, maybe I should make a building first. Let's make a stockpile. Let's do that. Uh, I want to build a building before we end this thing. So let's make like a... So I need clay and a large rock. Okay. Let's make a granary. There we go. So that's going to be nine big rocks. And like, how many? It's going to be nine big rocks. And it's going to be like 200 clay. 225 clay. That's okay. We have the stuff. Go ahead and put in a rock floor right there. I want to see how good this looks. But I want to make sure that our granary looks nice. That actually looks really sophisticated as flooring. I like it. I like it a lot. I'm actually really, really happy with that. And, I mean, honestly, the work speed on these characters is pretty good. All right, well, let's put in some walls. I can do log walls, and I think that sounds probably like the best idea. I mean, realistically, I would like to have rock walls for this area. But we would have to go gather more rocks, methinks. Actually, we still have a lot of rocks left. So we have 325 clay. That's going to be, like, nine walls. Honestly, we just need to get this covered, so I think it'll it'll work. Like, I'm not going to splurge on rock walls for every single building, but I feel like if you are going to splurge, it should be on your granary. So let's see how much of that they get done. I know we have enough stones. I just don't know that we have enough clay. There we go. So maybe we'll just have them come and dig up a little bit more clay. How's our, how's our, hey, we're actually gaining food. We have two days worth of food now. Sweet, man. Apparently my people have an affinity for mushrooms as well. Now, it looks like they build the walls pretty quickly. I was a little bit worried that this was going to turn into like an Unreal World thing where it takes you like three days to build one section of wall. But anyways, there's also, I wanted to point this out, there's an entire menu of all the ideas that are in the game for right now that shows you how to work your way all the way down the tech tree. And it seems like there's a lot of items and a lot of things in this current build. So that's good to see. And honestly, when it comes to any game that's kind of like in the early Iron Age, like the late Bronze Age, basically, there's all kinds of cool stuff they could do with this game that they could absorb on in. Really, the only limit is how many Wikipedia articles you can consume and then also implement into your game. But honestly, with Clan Folk, I'm pretty happy with it for right now. I think there's a solid chance. Normally, with a lot of like the RimWorld spin-off type games, I don't end up putting a whole lot of time into them. But given the subject matter and being really, really interested in like the Scottish Highlands and whatnot. I, I think I may put some time on into this one. I haven't seen any major warning signs about the game. Like, th I think the inventories can be a little bit messy, like with all of the icons and everything else, but that's kind of like a minor observation with all these little nested things that keep stacking up. It can get a little bit busy if you're trying to go, like, deeper and deeper on in. But honestly, that's a really, really minor thing considering it seems to me for all the world, like the rest of the game seems to be working out okay. And it looks like at some point we're going to be doing like equitable mercantile exchange with like neighboring tribes and stuff like that. And I think you do actually meet other clans inside this menu right here. And so anyways, it's kind of cool. I kind of dig it. Now hopefully I want to see, I want them, there we go, put in one of them walls right there. It looks a little rusty and crusty. Why does this stone wall look so rusty and crusty, man? Okay, I think it was just because it wasn't fully attached. But it won't look rusty and crusty anymore once we've got, like, the whole thing in. It's just that, like, for right now, we got, like, a little rusty crust thing going on. They should have enough clay, but I don't think they'll have enough big rocks. Oh, no, they finished it off. Okay, well, I'll probably actually, like, move that around and give it a door, and then we'll just move that storage inside of there so it's out of the elements.
But yeah, so far the building mechanics seem to work perfectly fine. It seems like the prioritization on the part of the AI is good. I haven't seen anybody get stuck. And I haven't seen the AI hit any like kind of game-breaking loops where it can't decide what it wants to do next. Uh, the movement seems to be pretty clean. The graphics are nice. And so honestly, if you're looking for RimWorld but in like a different setting where the threat is not necessarily aliens and bugs and robots and stuff like that, but instead just Mother Nature herself, and you want it set in like a realistic historical part of time, this might be kind of a cool game to play around with. It's called Clan Folk. My name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day. Sorry I cut this one a little bit long, but I'm having such a good time right now. Maybe I'll stream it on the day that this goes up, and we'll just see how far into the game we'll go. Now take care, everybody. That's all I got.